the Himalayas, remote and wild. Nepal's mountains are renowned for their picturesque beauty. But for the many people living in the shadows of its peaks, this stunning splendor can't be seen. I virtually do nothing. I just sit and eat. Things would be different if I wasn't blind. Around the world, 18 million people are blind from cataracts. A staggering 90% of them live in the developing world. But one man is trying to change that. I think uh, for people to see, not only see, but see well, uh, should be their right. Nepal is one of the world's poorest countries, and it's here that a Nepalese doctor is revolutionizing eye care, and he's training up an army of international doctors to fight alongside him. <laughs> I'm Yar Bumoham. On this edition of 101 East, we travel from Nepal to Indonesia, visiting remote communities paralyzed by blindness, and meet the doctors, giving them the gift of sight. Anglamu Sherpa is a 70-year-old grandmother living in the foothills of Nepal's Himalayan mountains. Home is 4,000 feet above sea level, with a view many would pay to see. But four years ago, her world faded to black. Hello. It started as if something poked me in the right eye, and then it moved on to the left. Anglamu is blind in both eyes and lives her days immobilized by darkness and fear. Her husband Rinji is both her eyes and her feet. Still, her world is confined to the walls of this house. I used to plough the fields, cut grass, and do a lot of work. Now I can't even fetch water. My husband has to do that. After a bad fall, Ang Lamu has needed constant attention, preventing her husband from tending their fields. Unable to support themselves, the elderly couple can only afford to eat corn powder mixed into black tea. If I don't take care of my wife, who will? I have to take care of the field and the cattle. She is blind, so she cannot do anything. Life is very tough for us now. But a solution is within sight. Anglamu has a form of blindness that is curable, cataract blindness. Across the country, an estimated 150,000 Nepalese struggle to see. Most are blind from cataracts, a clouding of the clear lens of the eye. But one doctor has made it his mission to help them see again. I've come to the Tilganga Institute of Ophthalmology to meet the man locals call the God of Sight. Hi, uh, Hi Dr. Ruit. How are Welcome. you? Yeah. Thanks for receiving us. Yeah. Sanduk Ruit is a world-renowned expert in cataract surgery. The 59-year-old Nepalese eye doctor has helped more than 100,000 people to see again. He's won dozens of awards and is one of the world's leading ophthalmologists. But Dr. Await still tries to give each of his patients some time, even for basic eye tests. These patients have come from very far away just to see me. Yeah, so uh, as much as possible, uh, I, 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 want to, I don't want to disappoint them. 
If I can spend one minute with them and they are happy, I'll do that. The centre in Kathmandu is not only a hospital, but also a state-of-the-art lens factory. Each year, 350,000 lenses are produced here for cataract patients and sold across the world. In the US, it costs $100 to manufacture just one lens. Here, it costs only $3. We sell them for about $3 or $3 plus. So you're not making much of a problem. No, no, no. The idea is not to make money. It's made uh, uh, a huge public health uh, impact. It's made that millions of people who really needed the surgery, particularly in the low economic group, to come within the bracket of the possibility of having modern eye care, modern cataract surgery. Dr. Await is not only producing cheap lenses, He's also changing the lives of the country's poorest by providing free surgeries all over Nepal. Today, he's preparing to take his clinic out on the road. Looks like you have a lot of equipment here. Yes, uh, this is a very meticulous preparation as it is done in an expedition, you know. Inventory of equipments, inventory of instrumentations, and, uh, and then the team. So it's basically you taking the whole hospital up with you? Yes, exactly, yeah. Dr. Await's team has conducted more than 200 eye camps in remote areas. On this trip, the 14-man team will carry about 400 kilograms of surgical tools, lenses, food and water, including two portable microscopes. <laughs> Dr. Await has invited me to join him and his daughter on this trip. We begin with a day's drive deep into the mountains. The next morning, the journey gets tougher. It's just after sunrise and we're setting off on what we're told is a treacherous climb to the mobile eye campsite. And we're not the only ones who'll be arriving there by foot. Blind patients from across these mountains will walk across challenging terrain, sometimes for days, just to see Dr. Rawit. It's a steep climb, but this is familiar terrain for Dr. Rawit. He grew up in similar foothills in a remote village in eastern Nepal where he learned what it means to lose somebody to illness. When he was a teenager, his sister died of tuberculosis. Her passing away was very eventful in my life because she passed away in front of me. And also uh, I felt a certain amount of you know, emptiness inside. You know, uh, a medical conditions like this can take away dear ones from you so soon. So I really felt that maybe this is a profession that I should take up. Yep. This will be the first eye camp ever held in this region. The risk of getting a cataract rises in such high altitudes with prolonged exposure to ultraviolet rays. This combined with poor nutrition and lack of basic medical care make cataracts the leading cause of preventable blindness in the developing world. After an eight-hour trek, we arrive in the village of Bumti. Most of the people here are Sherpas, an ethnic group made famous for climbing Everest. Dr. Await's staff arrived ahead of us and have already begun setting up. The team is rushing to transform this unfinished building into a makeshift hospital. It's all hands on deck to turn this room into a surgical theatre. Everything is going to be sterilised, the walls and floors scrubbed down in preparation for surgery tomorrow. Some patients are still making their way to the camp. For Ang Lamu, this surgery could change her life. 
I'm extremely happy that the eye camp is here in my village. I really hope that the operation works and I'll be grateful for that. Getting his wife to the eye camp is a challenge for Rinji. He's too weak to carry his wife, so his brother has come along to help. Two hours later, they finally arrive. But the mood is subdued. They're nervous about what's to come. <laughs> In the now sterilized operating theater, Dr. Awit is getting ready for a long day. He aims to complete at least 50 surgeries. Doctors in the West do only 10 to 15 on a busy day. I join him as he explains the small incision surgery technique he pioneered. I made a little cut on the front surface of the lens, which is like the boiled eggs out the front shell. Now what I'm doing next is I'm isolating the nucleus, which is the yolk of the egg. Grab the nucleus from the back and take it out in one go like that, see? Oh wow, that's incredible. Yeah. And what you're left now is the back shell of the egg, beautifully intact. With the clouded, damaged lens now removed, Dr. Awit carefully slides in an artificial one. This technique requires no stitches. And this is the concept of the, the small incision surgery. It becomes self-sealing. The surgery is over in less than seven minutes, and in less than 24 hours, the patient will see again. Dr. Awit spent years creating and perfecting this stitch-free surgical technique. Today, his method is widely practiced around the world by doctors who travel to Nepal to train under him. Many come from developing countries like Indonesia, Myanmar, Ethiopia, and even North Korea. That's good. The rest? Not all of them speak good English, so Dr. Awit patiently guides them with hand actions. Suck in, and then we're gonna push, suck, push, okay? Yeah. Dr. Joyce Claudine is an eye doctor from a remote island in Indonesia. A recent medical graduate, she's here for a month-long training program with Dr. Awit. I think uh, she'll be able to do cases uh, independently now, more or less, and very nearly perfecting the technique. She may need to do about uh, another 2,000 before she can move to the side incision. So. Every year, Dr. Rawit and his team train about 50 foreign eye doctors. For them, learning under Dr. Rawit is a lifelong dream. Dr. Rawit is an amazing eye doctor, a good man who wants to share his knowledge with other eye doctors, regardless of which country you come from. For Dr. Joyce, it's a steep learning curve. In Indonesia, I would operate on two to three patients a day, whereas since I've arrived here, I typically operate on nine to ten patients daily. It's late afternoon and both doctors have been operating for more than five hours. But the crowd outside, desperate for their turn, isn't easing up. Finally, it's Anglamo's turn. Mm -hmm. These cataracts are not only mature, but they have over-matured and about to burst out. If she left it for longer, would it be possible to operate? Yeah, there's a very good chance that she may go into a, what's called a lens-induced glaucoma and uh, would probably be left with an absolute blind eye. Incurable. After a few minutes, the surgery is done. Sounds good. Yeah. 
It's the end of an exhausting day, but it's not over yet. Dr. Awit has just heard about a family who has locked up their blind, aging father. There's some kind of barrier from the children for him to have surgery. Dr. Awit questions the man's son. Inside, it's a heartbreaking scene. We find a disoriented man wielding a stick for protection. <laughs> Dr. Await calms him and then checks his eyes. But it's too late. The man's eyes are dead. Dr. Await can only offer relief for the occasional pain, not sight. I think basically uh, this, is a, this is an extreme case of uh, uh, blindness leading to isolation, leading to social and psychological shutdown, you know, yeah. And the patient, you can't do much about it, yeah. Sadly, Dr. Awit says he sees cases like this far too often. If caught earlier, the man could have been treated, but now he's permanently blind. To his family, he's simply a burden. The next morning back at the eye camp, anticipation and anxiety fill the air. Okay, okay. Purple is round, good. No one seems as anxious as Anglamu. I <laughs> 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 She says, I'm ready to wake up. Fast, fast. You know, Yara, this surgical intervention is one of the few, you know, where you will see uh, the patient like this just within 24 hours, you know, uh, and after 24 hours, she's at least 10 years younger than she was yesterday. So it brings the life back. Brings the life, you know, the, the smile, the authority in her in a, in a psycho psychology and confidence. And uh, she, she probably has a, like she expressed the word, uh, you know, beautifully today, getting awake from a deep sleep, you know, that itself says so. None of these villagers here thought they'd ever see again. For Ang Lamu, it's a new beginning. I feel like I've just come out of my mother's womb and everything is so clear. I just want to do my work and roam in the field. I haven't been anywhere in the past few years, but once I gain strength, I would like to travel around. While Dr. Awit is proud to offer free or cheap health care, he says his biggest achievement is passing his knowledge on to other doctors. 
Today, he's helped build hospitals in Ghana, Ethiopia, India and China. We have been very encouraged uh, in the last 20 years of our training that it has made a lot of impact. And uh, so training other people is uh, so, so important, really. And it's, it's an effect into hundreds, thousands and millions of people. They will teach other people. It's the end of Dr. Joyce's month-long training in Nepal. She'll be taking what she's learned home to Indonesia, to the small island of Nias, where she'll serve as the only trained eye doctor. It's a lot of pressure, but she remains upbeat. Yes, I'm happy to return to Nias. Apart from seeing my family, I can also help the cataract patients in Nias regain their eyesight. A few days later, I also head for Indonesia. I want to see how Dr. Joyce is doing. If doctors are having problems getting into Nepal's mountains, Indonesia's 17,000 islands are even more challenging. It's why having a local eye surgeon is crucial. Indonesia has one of the highest rates of cataract blindness in the world, with experts estimating between two and three million people affected by the disease. There's been no official studies done here on Nias Island, but it's not just adults who are suffering from cataract blindness, and we're about to find out why. While altitude is a problem in Nepal, here is the ultraviolet rays reflecting off the water. For a community that spends a lot of time on the ocean, many are at high risk of developing cataracts. Today, Dr. Joyce is conducting the island's first cataract surgery camp. Two of Dr. Rawit's former students have flown in to help. While cataracts are usually associated with older people, we find children among the waiting patients. For cataracts in children, there is a possibility they have it from birth, or that the pregnant mother suffered from malnutrition or fever contracted chickenpox. But usually, the cataracts don't fully form until they are about 11 to 17 years old. These siblings are given something to comfort them in preparation for what's to come. It takes about five minutes for the anesthesia to take effect, and then it's time for surgery. In the theatre, Dr. Joyce is getting ready to operate on her first child patient. Dr. Joyce. Thirteen-year-old Solvan Talambanua is afraid of needles and hid the fact that he was blind in one eye. But when he found out there was a free eye camp, he confessed to his parents that he had trouble seeing. Dr. Joyce makes the incision. But it's not easy to keep her young patient calm. But it's soon over, and Solvan is sent off to recover. For Dr. Joyce, it's on to the next patient. The hospital that she's working in is extremely basic. Sanitation is a problem. And there's a severe lack of medical equipment. We found only one steriliser. But fortunately, with Dr. Awit's technique, you don't need much and 264 operations are completed here in just two days. The next morning, the patients line up. They and Dr. Joyce are about to find out if the surgeries worked. One after another, the covers are removed and their eyes slowly adjust to seeing again. Dr. Joyce's young patient, Solvan, is now able to see in his right eye. It'll take time before Solvan fully recovers. Uh, how far can you see? Maybe one meter? Uh, 
senang dan bangga. I feel happy and proud when my patients regain their eyesight after their operations. Operasi dapat melihat kembali. As their sight slowly clears, the patients begin to sing and dance. It's been a successful first camp. From Nepal to Indonesia, Dr. Rawit's vision is inspiring a new generation of doctors. With the surgery so simple, and for many, free. They're not only restoring sight to the world's poorest, they're restoring hope.